Hello, my name is Richard Lester. I'm a filmmaker, or was a filmmaker, um, and uh, I'm here to answer as many questions as I can and try to remain calm throughout. There was a script for a Hard Day's Night. I wouldn't call it a shooting script. Um, it just was the, the second or third version that, that Alan and I worked on, Alan Owen being the script writer. Um, what it did is that it produced fairly concrete dialogue for the Beatles to perform. But as far as when they were uh, given the chance to run about or ex escape from the police or have various action sequences, that was left up to us to ad lib on the night, as it were. Um, there, there was only one sequence which was almost entirely ad libbed, and that was a press conference scene, where what we did is we gave the actors who were playing the part of journalists, the questions, and most of the, the answers were ad-libbed, and sometimes we would cut one answer to another question so that it may, became even more surreal. But by and large, the structure of the script was absolutely in place before we started. Where the songs were going to go was in place before we started. But for the rest of it, there were little moments where the script just said, the boys escape down a fire escape and play in a field. Um, it, that's all we had to work on when we turned up on the day to do it, and, and we had lived that. Well, The Bed Sitting Room is one of the maddest films that I made, and how we got to make it is even madder than that. Um, I told, I, I arranged to make a film with Ian McKellen and two girls and Mick Jagger to make a light comedy musical from a story outlined by Joe Orton. Um, and he was going to write the screenplay for, for it. And the night before he was due to come down and have our first working meeting at Twickenham Studios, he was murdered by his partner. And so suddenly there was nobody to, to work on the screenplay. And because Joe's writing was so unique, it was almost impossible to find somebody who could marry his style with theirs. So we abandoned it at the last minute, and, and instead, I remembered having seen, and having worked with, uh, for many years with Spike Milligan, had seen his play called The Bed Sitting Room. I, I tried to make a film of that. Uh, Spike didn't write the screenplay because he felt he'd done all he could with the, the play. And in a way, his was a much lighter version than the, the film ended up. But needless to say, the biggest problem was that I had never, in my panic for all this, remembered to let United Artists know that we had changed it from being a, a pop musical into the bed sitting room. And so when the head of United Artists saw the rough cut for the first time, not having known anything else that was going on. The look on his face of disgust was absolutely extraordinary. And um, it, it, he walked out of his own film about two reels before it finished. So I don't know how it's lasted as long as it has, but somehow a, a, bit, a bit like a very rough old claret that keeps in its bottles after about 30, 40 years, it's turned out not too badly. It's difficult for me to talk about myself in this, in, in this way because I'm not, I'm not 
as, as no one is a very particularly good judge of your own character or your own reasons, I somehow felt that a, a huge release when I left America. I was only 22, and I never really went back. And as you can see, if you're looking at me, I am no longer in my 20s. So for, for, in essence, I have lived out of America, uh, and I've lived without, uh, apart from a, a year or so, um, in England for 60, 60, some 60 years. Um, I, I always liked some of the literature uh, of England, and I liked some of the filmmaking in England, but I, I, I don't think that that was necessarily the reason for my trying to escape from America and feeling so comfortable when I got here. Um, it, it just happened, and I found around me people who felt, to, who more or less had the same feelings for comedy and, and for entertainment that I had. I mean, I was very fortunate that I met Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan within the first year that I was here. Um, and because of that, uh, I, I fell into a kind of work that I could do uh, and, and felt really at home with them. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Who are my heroes? Um, well, in, in the cinema, undoubtedly Buster Keaton was the first, and he was an old man when I finally got the opportunity to work with him. Um, we made a funny thing happen on the way to the forum together. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he was one of the, the greatest physical movers and one of the greatest directors of movement that has ever been in the cinema. But he, he at the time we started working together on it, uh, was dying of um, throat cancer. He didn't know it. Uh, his wife was a, a, a nurse and she kept him going and kept, him, oh, kept the knowledge away from him. But it meant that, that um, he, he was very short of breath and therefore not really able to do anything that he, he used to do. Um, so what we did, we had to, to, to ration very carefully. But it was a, a still a, an enormous thrill. We did once have one Sunday where I just said, here's my crew. We'll go out into a field and do anything you want to do, and I'll see if I can find a way to put it in the film, which is a wonderful thing for me. Uh, other heroes? Uh, I suppose, I mean, I, I think rather than say hero, I would rather say who are the people that had the most influence in my life. One of the earliest was I, I while I was still working for CBS television, I. I did a morning comedy program, and um, on the, my competitor on NBC was a man called Ernie Kovacs, who I think was, was one of the most innovative minds working at the very early days of television. And we're, and we're talking about 1950, 1951, 52, so when television really hadn't been going that long. Um, and he, he I mean, people normally only remember him here for being the police chief in our man in Havana. But he was a, a wonderfully inventive comic, and he was a big influence on me. Spike Milligan certainly was an, a, an immense influence on my life. John Lennon was a, a very big influence on my life. Um, I've been pretty blessed to have three people like that, or four people like that, that I can call on and say, I've had the experience of learning from, from them. So uh, I, can't, I couldn't ask for more. I think the goons and, quote, goon humor uh, influenced enormously the 
continuation of a train of surrealist humor. And I think I better explain how, how I would define surrealism is where you have two concentric circles of reality meeting. That point at which they meet is where the surreal can happen. So if for a, a radio show you would say, Captain, what's our course? He could say prunes and custard. And, or if you would have a spiral st staircase, you could have U-boat commanders and chorus girls going down at the same time. That, that point that you have where you could switch from one reality to the next was very much part of goon humor. And if you can see the line that it went from, from the goons to Monty Python and Monty Python onwards, there's pretty, pretty well a, a, an unbroken line. And it goes back to Edward Lear, Stephen Leacock, um, um, Alice in Wonderland. It, it, it was there. Um, the anarchic qualities that Spike brought to surrealism um, that willingness to fight against the establishment is something else which we hope that all of us have tried to carry on. And uh, certainly that if you look at uh, John Cleese's work and, and Spike's work and John Lennon's work, because Lennon was very influenced by Spike, and that Lennon's writing uh, the use of words I in an anarchic way. Uh, it's, it's alive and well, and uh, there are a lot of people that are s working in it today that, uh, that, that you can see every night of the week on television. Uh, I hope the questions aren't better than the answers, um, but I certainly am grateful for the interest that you all seem to have had in what's the left of my career. Thanks all.